Well, good evening. I am so excited to be here again <clears throat> and really want to talk to you tonight about what does it mean to be a boy and a man in 2020. So the answer to this question ought to be the same as, well, it's the same thing that it meant to be a boy and a man in 1920. And it is, but it really isn't because we're living in a day that's completely and utterly different. I love the Founding Fathers. When they wrote the Declaration, they had this beautiful phrase that we hold these truths to be self-evident. They could have never, ever imagined, could they have looked into the portals of time and thought about the fact that someday we'd be actually be debating absolutely everything foundational to the human experience. What is a life? What is a marriage? What is a man? What is a woman? All these things are now up for grabs, seemingly, and so we are in a new day. We have to be wise, and we have to be discerning. Um, so let's talk about what that means. I want to look with you tonight behind the science, the sociology, and the anthropology, and then finally the theology behind God's design in each one of these areas for what does it mean to be masculine? What does manhood mean in 2020? There are actually very important inherent objective differences between men and women. Newsflash, men and women are different. <laughs> I know that's radical out there, but it really is the same. See, the world wants us to believe that humans are all basically the same, and the distinctions between men and women, that's just like Mr. Potato Head, you know? Like, they're just parts, and they're interchangeable, and it's not a big deal. If you want to be a man or a woman, you just change your parts. No, 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 that's not it at all. From the very essence of who men and women are, they are different in their chemistry, in their biology, in their physiology, in their mental processes. Everything about them is different. And it's only in the last nanosecond of human history that the world all of a sudden is going, oh no, let's just cast off science and common sense and logic and biology and history and tradition and the collective wisdom of human history. Let's forget all about all that stuff and let's just do this new thing. That'll be cool. Because if we don't do it, somebody's going to yell at me and we don't want to be yelled at. So we have to do it. And so that's what's happening. It's literally that simple. They're doing this all because they don't want to be screamed at. Literally, it's just a lack of courage. I mean, that's literally all it is. There's no science behind any of it, anything other than just a political movement. So what's interesting is that the world is interested, instead of celebrating differences, which they say they're celebrating, they celebrate androgyny. They celebrate gender ambiguity. They celebrate gender fluidity. They don't celebrate distinctions, don't they? And so what's interesting, because God is a God of distinctions, the world is interested in slipperiness, in vagueness, because the lie, lies can be found in the slippery. Deception lives in the vague and deceit lives in the obscure. The truth is found in a clear distinction. One of the, whole, one of the basic premises of Christian theology is that creation, wholly different and separate and distinct from creation. The creator and the creation are just separate and distinct. It's a basic theological truth. Now, some of the uniquenesses we're going to talk about between men and women um, are there in every man, and some of them are, are, there's some variations. But let's talk about the three areas. First, first, first of all, the reason that we're talking about uh, boys and men in crisis, because when boys are in crisis, men are in crisis, is not just because we're in Trail Life USA, but I give this talk everywhere, and it's and I even with women in the audience who appreciate it, and it's because men literally are in crisis disproportionately. And Mark could give you statistic after statistics, which I think he will tomorrow night in his talk about how men are disadvantaged. I got to meet a fellow named Warren Farrell, who wrote a book called The Boy Crisis. Not a Christian, in fact, not even a conservative. He was a feminist member of the National Organization for Women many years ago was, the, was like the leading male figure in the organization. And as he started looking at the research, he started asking questions. And he started saying, well, wait a second, we're talking about women, but men actually here are disproportionately disadvantaged, and especially boys. And he began to push this data, and then suddenly he realized they said, you need to get back on the talking points. And he said, no, I want to go with the data and the research. And then they said goodbye, and they rejected him from the left. And now he kind of comes to some 
kind of marriage conferences and things, but he's a fascinating guy, written a whole book on this thing. But some of these are some of the facts right here of how boys really are in crisis. And you could go on and on and on, and we could talk about this all night, but it is the case that uh, boys are in crisis. George Orwell was, says that sometimes the first duty of intelligent men is to restate the obvious. We're going to do a lot of restating the obvious tonight to start off with as a foundation. So let's talk first about the science. Um, and it's funny because there's a lot of talk about science denying and all of this, but there really is some really good science about what it means to be a man. And it all starts with chemistry. It's DNA. The moment that God sovereignly chooses, when the sperm and the egg come together, the moment that he chooses for that human being to become a male or a female, he locks in genetic code, he locks in the chromosome, he chooses in that moment, it's his choice. I want, to, I want you to see God's design in every aspect of what we're talking about. Not just what's in the Bible, but every aspect of science that's in the world. The moment that he does that, DNA is locked in. We can know that, we can know that human being's hair color, eye color, their size, their approximate weight, depending on some variables and other things. And one of the huge pieces of chemistry... Duh, that's in men, that's not in women, is testosterone. Now, everyone has testosterone. Men have more than women. Women have more estrogen. Men have estrogen, too. But the presence of testosterone radically affects lots of different things. Muscle growth, increased strength, bone mass density, red cell blood production, sperm production, hair growth, collagen growth. So all of these things are happening in the womb, actually, of the baby. Um, we know that uh, with a child in the womb that they're being exposed to actually very, very considerable uh, levels of testosterone. Uh, Margaret McCarthy, professor of physiology at the University of Maryland, who studies early brain development, said male babies are born with as much testosterone as a 25-year-old man. And as bir after birth, testosterone plummets until a boy reaches puberty. And see, what this does is that testosterone actually radically alters the brain. And this is, um, it actually goes after the corpus calamus. So, so there's two sides of the brain, the left brain and the right brain, which we're going to talk about. But it actually severs and, and bulks up the synapses between the connections between the two brain. So, so women have this ability to actually move back and forth between the left and the right brain more seamlessly. And they more have better intuition and things of that nature. Whereas men have to kind of shift gears to go from thinking to feeling, if at all, and they can do that. So you've heard, <laughs> that's right. Um, so you've heard about the difference between left and right brain. The left brain governs logic, facts, um, realism, categories, plan and orderly things, structure, three-dimensional spacing, uh, math and science-minded nonfiction. The right brain is more emotional, focused on art and creativity, imagination, uh, occasionally kind of absent-mindedness. There's got to be some men that go there sometimes, right? I know I do. Um, the nothing box, as, as that guy likes to say, uh, prefers fiction and then enjoys creative storytelling. <clears throat> this was one... Um, it's one artist uh, depiction of the left and right brain I thought was funny, so I threw it up there. So, so this, is, this presence of testosterone radically affects uh, the infant's brain, the unborn child's brain, which then continues and creates a structure which then determines how men will think. So you've already got the chromosomes, the DSA, DNA working, which then informs all of this and, and helps them know what's happening. So... Um, there are many physiological differences, right? So many differences. Um, differences between men and women. Men have different organs than women's do. Men cannot have children. Yes, we need to keep saying this because this is a really, really big thing that women can do that men cannot do. It's a huge difference. All the plumbing, all the biology, all the chemistry is built to have, to have children and women, and men cannot do that. So we need to scream that from the mountaintop and be proud of that. That is something that the world just, oh, that's no big deal. It's just babies, right? No, it's not just babies. That's a really big deal. So um, men have more muscle mass. Men has less, less fatty tissue. Now, gentlemen, you don't go home and say, I learned tonight that women have more fatty tissue. That would be the wrong thing to do. I'm just making the observation that men have less fatty tissue. Men tend to have more body hair because of this testosterone. 
you lined up all the men in the world, they're taller than all the women in the world, in every country, in every civilization on the face of the earth. Men are physically stronger in every country, every place. Now, you're going to have some women that, you know, we got Marvel's coming out with the, the woman Thor, right? You have to have these, all these women that are like artificially strong somehow. But okay, so, but you, so you will have some women Thor every now and then, but on balance, men are going to be just stronger. Uh, they're going to be faster runners and faster swimmers. Actually, and one of the reasons for this is because all men and even young men, when uh, young ladies have that growth spurt, uh, before, over men, they, their lung capacity enables them to produce more oxygen so they can actually run faster and swim faster a, a, than women can. This is a very important differences. Um, the United States Marine Corps has, as you know, in 2017, the Associated Press announced that the Marine Corps was going to try to reach a ratio of one female to every 10 uh, uh, ma males, and they announced that we do not going to change the standards for physical training. They were very clear. Hang on, hang on, let's finish the story. They were not going to change the physical standards for training initially. But on that same day, CNN reported that the only female officer enrolled in the Marine Corps dropped out after failing to complete two conditioning hikes last month. Turns out that the particular female officer was the second of only two to have attempted this particular course. General John Kelly at the time said, if we don't change our standards, it'll be very, very difficult if we have any numbers, if any real numbers, come into the infantry. Initially, it was claimed to be no lowering of physical standards in any compact position. Now, this is just a basic trying to deny reality. Uh, and, and you know, th gentlemen, this, is not, this doesn't mean you're better when the scripture says um, the wife is your weaker vessel. I think that physically means physically, physically weaker. Doesn't mean you're better, just means we're different. So, um, in God's design, you can take a globe and you can spin the globe and you can stab your finger on any landmass in all of human civilization, and you're always going to find some sociological constants, right? And this is the differences between men and women. So, with men, you're going to have, they're going to be stronger in logic, stronger in reasoning, stronger in risk taking, weaker in nurturing skills, weaker in communication skills. Men are going to be weaker in relational and emotional intelligence. That sixth sense, that ability to read what's going on, to read people, is always going to be weaker on balance with, with men. A um, little bit denser there. And then uh, the ability to be just understanding verbal clues. Women are much better at that. One of the most recent studies, this just came out in March of 2019, major study in Montreal, Canada, shows that the biological pathways that women process pain and experience physical pain are completely different than the way men does. And it's opened up this huge gap in medicine now at, 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 at scientists having to look at, should we really prescribe the same medications for men and women? Or should we actually look at the process and study, are there better medications or different medications in terms of how they can be given? So this is, again, a whole new thing that has opened up. So let's talk about sociology and anthropology. Sociology is the study of society and patterns and social relationships and culture. Anthropology is looking back at the study of human societies and cultures and their development over time. So um, let's talk about this. Certain professions all over the world are dominated by men. Now, some the world loves to say, oh, that's because of conditioning, that's because you give the boy a truck and you dress him in blue and all of that, but, but it's really not. It is really not. We know that everywhere around the world, brick and stone mason layers, drywall installers, construction workers, machine operators, uh, truck mechanics, diesel engine specialists, not that women can't do these jobs, and some do, but on balance, you're going to have way more men do these jobs, and the opposite is true, too. Many jobs you'll have more women uh, gravitate towards uh, than men. Um, here's a breakdown of major declarations based upon gender in uh, basically in, in colleges. Mathematics, 86.7% math majors. Philosophy, 77.8% male. But look at art, 92.9%. Physiology, 87% uh, female, and on and on. So this is um, the heart, the uh, Rob Rye, the hardest uh, class in undergraduate school at Harvard University is called Math 55. And in fact, they brag about it. They say this is probably the most difficult undergraduate math class in the country. 
Okay, so uh, several years ago, they, they, they tried to do a little study, and of course, in the Harvard Crimson, the final course drop forms were duly submitted and finalizing the class roster, there were 45% Jewish students, 18% Asian students, but 100% male, the tribe has spoken, they said. Now, why is that? Well, that's just because men tend to gravitate because of the way that they think and the way their physiology is, is toward meth. And now, since 2001, the whole world has been promoting, and this is a good thing, the whole world has been promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, especially to young ladies. But you know what? It hasn't changed the numbers one bit. It hasn't changed the numbers one bit. I remember hearing, I went to the Supreme Court Historical Society meeting, and the American Bar Association president was there, and she was talking about how horrible it was that all these women lawyers, and by the way, women lawyers are now, now exceed men, so not so in, in, in the practice of law, because it, it requires both human and intellectual things. I think it's a very dynamic thing, and so it's not something that's dominated by men anymore. And in fact, there's more women that are graduated from law school than men, footnote. So she was saying, oh, this is horrible. The women are, they're leaving the practice of law at about 30 or 40 years old. And she was, we have to study this and find out the problem. And I'm thinking, I'm sorry, are you pro-choice? <laughs> like a woman wants to leave the practice of law, probably because of family or children or situations like that, and want to have flexibility. And you think that's a crisis because they're choosing that? You want to force them back into it? So I thought that's so crazy, but that's how the world is thinking. So look at this, women and work, 88% in nursing, social work 91%, nutrition 89%, child development 80%, 97%, health science 85%. Look at this, physics 13% women, mechanical engineering 7%, civil engineering 7%, electrical engineering 6%, computer science 4 and construction 6 How many of you have seen the movie Hidden Secrets? Amazing movie, see it, it's family friendly, there's nothing bad in it, it's positive, it's a historical, kind of a little bit fictional, but historical, uh, it's just a great, great movie. But it's not the norm. Like the whole world is trying to force women into this masculine situation where you can do this if you want to. And, and it's actually, there's good, I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna like mock that because it's good, we should encourage. If a girl is good at something, let's encourage her to do it. If your daughters are good, but let's not just act like there's no differences at all and try to force the opposite conclusions that God has designed in, in the mainstream. So Margaret Mead was an anthropologist in the, uh, in the late 70s. She was very uh, well known and, and well, well respected. She said this, in every known human society around the world, the young male learns that when he grows up, one of the things that he must do in order to be a full member of society is to provide food and protection for some female and her young. Every known human society rests on the learn nurturing behavior of men. Um, my good friend Glenn Stanton, uh, we actually had Glenn at Camp Aiken. He's the gender studies expert of folks in the family. I've traveled all over and spoken with Glenn. We've debated people together, and he's just a great person. Was actually at Louisville and the founding representing folks in the family um, of this organization. Um, but he has said this, virtually across all cultures, manhood has largely consisted of three essential qualities, procreation, provision, and protection. If the boy doesn't learn these things, then he's likely not to become a good, selfless, serving man. Shame and derision from the community will become his lot. And now he quotes Margaret Mead, this behavior being learned is fragile and can disappear rather easily under social conditions that no longer teach it effectively. Such domestic education can disappear within a generation. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing that right now. So Glenn says something that's very interesting. He says this, that if a woman comes out on a stage, that womanhood is an essence. So in other words, the woman doesn't have to do anything in action to prove she's a woman. I mean, okay, so if you're like Roseanne Barr and you botch the national anthem really bad and you grab yourself and spit, okay, yeah, not a woman, right? So she, she lost her womanhood. But for a woman to come out, a woman kind of has a presence and that he argues that womanhood is an essence and it develops naturally and partly because mostly there's more children with mothers than there are with fathers. 
I think that's an environmental cause. But the loss of woman comes from what she does, not from what she doesn't do. However, if a man comes in the room and he's muscular and looks, looks masculine, whatever that means, uh, you know, he still has to prove himself in action, right? He, it comes from his loss of manhood comes from what he fails to do. So if you have the proverbial burning building and the child that needs to be rescued and there's a man and a woman, it's not like you go, oh, yeah, well, equal rights, you go ahead. <laughs> no, the man says, yes, I'm going to go. And he goes in the building and he rescues the child. And then, of course, when they interview him later, he doesn't go, yeah, I was awesome. I was amazing. What does he say? You are a hero. What's the guy always say? Oh, it's, any guy would have done that. Right? I'm not a hero. It's just what we did. And so that's the difference. And so I think, I think we can see this. I think that manhood for young men is something we have to invite men into. We have to invite them into, we have to show them the way, we have to call them into manhood. And I think that this is the beauty, uh, formerly with scouting, now with our organizations, to have a rite of passage. And I think this is what the Freedom Award does, and, and even our ranking system. It's a rite of passage where with each progression, we're saying, you are becoming a man. You're becoming a man. And so we don't, we no longer, I mean, a lot of men are able to hunt, used to have to hunt in order to just get food. That was a, that was a thing required for life. But to bring home uh, an animal and see it slaughtered, it wasn't in the killing though, it was actually in the killing, it was in the providing that the whole tribe is now nourished on this animal. And it was like, yes, okay, I've done something. And that's part of being a man, is that a man has to produce more than he makes. If he is not producing more than he makes, if he's consuming more and he has nothing left over, that is not a part of the deal with what men are supposed to be doing. And so that's a very important part. Another anthropologist, David Gilmore, says this, one of my findings here is that manhood ideologies always include a criterion of selfless generosity. This guy's not a Christian, okay? Even to the point of sacrifice. Again and again, we find that Real men, and I want to come back to that phrase, quote, real men, are those who give, mo give more than they take away. They serve others. Real men are generous, even to a fault. Non-men are those stigmatized as stingy and unproductive. And you know, we have a lot of... Um, I mean, we have a very sophisticated society that we have grown up into. And we have technology, we have birth control, we have rights and a constitution. So we have a developed civilization, um, things that are very different. And because of those things I just talked about, especially technology and legal rights, women have a whole different set of choices now than they had. Some of those are very good. Most of those things are common grace that God has given us as a society. But there's also distinct disadvantages. But if you put, uh, in philosophy, we talked about a state of nature or tabula rasa. And so if you put people, let's say you're going to build, let's say you're going to go into a missionary tribe and there's no, no civilization there, there's no infrastructure, there's no government, you're just going to build society from the ground up. Or they have this crazy show called Naked and Afraid where they just put a man and a woman on an island, they try to get them to survive together. Well, if you do that, you suddenly realize that Okay, first thing we have to do is we have to figure out a way to protect ourselves, right? Because the sun can burn you, literally, and poison you eventually, and you'll die from that. There's animals, so eventually you have to build a shelter, right? Uh, if, there's, if there's no birth control, what's going to happen? We uh, children are going to be born, almost as a matter of fact, if the men and women are together. And so you're going to have children. Who's going to take care of the children? Probably breastfeeding those children, right? Uh, 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 and so, so you see these roles come into very strong clarity about protecting and nurturing children and protecting and defending the family and providing for the family when there's no technology, when there's no common grace of technology, when there's no common grace of legal rights or infrastructure of all the cool things that we have when we're born into society. We see the roles come into great clarity. And I'm not saying we should return to that. I think all of this stuff is, is good and gives us more options. Now, nowhere in all of um, in anthropology do we find the differences between men and women to be more, con more different than in parenting. Okay, Parenting, we have stark stark differences. And if you haven't raised a child, this is the only way you can know these things. But really, men and women, uh, mothers and fathers, parent so differently. We discipline differently. We 
motivate differently. We communicate differently. We teach children differently. Um, there was a time, uh, you know what the things, you know, here's something that a father does that a mother doesn't do. A father wrestles with his children. And what you're doing is you're actually, when a father, especially with her son, when he's wrestling, he's teaching that child the limitations of physical force. Because when he hits too hard, say, okay, you want to go there? We're going to go back. So, so this wrestling, it shows him, okay, what's too hard? What's too soft? How to be gentle? How, how to do that? You go into any inner city in this country, and you're going to see what happens when young men do not have the benefit of a father wrestling, teaching them the limitations of force. It's a brutal society. And that's part of the, the tragic uh, tragedy of, of fatherlessness in our son. There was a time in my home where my kids would rather wrestle in the bed than go to Disney World, and there were distinct economic advantages to that. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. If, I, if they came in, I said, Disney World, wrestle in the bed, they would go, wrestle in the bed. Ah, okay, okay. okay this, this is true. Now, not so today. They're a little bit more sophisticated than they were back then. Now, what's something else that happens? With, I have four children. With every one of my children, when they were somewhere between, I don't know, six months to nine months-ish, I would take them, and this is a little ceremony that I have, as a baby, and I would toss them in the air, first slightly, and then a little more, and the baby's, wee, they're loving it, and it's like an E-ride at Disney World, and I'm doing this with each one of my children, and of course, you have to make sure they're ahead, but I'm giving them a little bit more, and a little bit more, yeah. Let me tell you something. This is exclusively a dad thing. Mothers do not throw babies in the air. Okay? You can Google search it. There's no mothers anywhere. And if they do throw their kids in the air, I'll call DCF on them and say, take them away. They're not fit mother, right? Now, this is funny, right? And I did this. I, I did this naturally. I, I didn't think about this. And a lot of dads do this. But see, there's something very powerful going on because when I toss the child in the air, I'm saying, I'm strong. You can trust me. I'm going to be there for you. I may toss you out of the nest one day, but I'm going to be here for you right? All that, something very powerful is going on with each one of these human interactions that a father has, that a mother has. What do mothers do that fathers don't do? Coo, nurture for hours and hours, whether they're bottle feeding or breastfeeding, they are sitting there and there's something very powerful that's happening. There's a connection between a baby and a mother for hours I'm not doing that. If I got a baby for more than 60 seconds, I'm... I mean, we're doing a monster truck rally for more than 30 seconds if I got a baby in my hands, right? It's just different. Mothers are nurturing. They're communicating security and safety and protection. Dads are communicating risk and fun and, you know, all that stuff that comes with the testosterone. So these are very different impulses. Not better, just different. And here's the sad part. All of this has been politicized today. Every single thing that's important in our world has been politicized. And what's sad is the church is going, oh, we don't talk about politics. Well, the world has put politics on everything. So it's like we can't hardly talk about anything. Supposedly, we can actually. Legally and spiritually and morally, we can and we should and we are now. So that's why we're doing it. But the point is, is that the church is catering. They're going back in the corner because people are saying, oh, those are political issues. No, they're not. They're biblical issues. They're who we are as human beings. This is talking about God's design for all this stuff, right? And so this is sad. So, so here's the world's paradigm. We know that God creates us from that moment of the chromosomes. He says, I am calling you to be a man or a woman. That's objective. It's scientific. You can test it. You can repeat the test. It's completely objective. Now, gender is a legitimate concept, but it has been completely twisted and it has made the main thing. Gender is the sense in which you have about your objective sense. Now, it makes sense logically that God would want to have us think about ourselves in the way he created us, not in a way he did not create us. Okay? Now, every child is going to have some degree of fluidity, some degree of confusion, some degree of exploration, some degree of trying to figure out what in the world is going on with my body, right? And so that's natural. That is good. That's why we're here as parents and as leaders to help them through that carefully and wisely using youth protection training and all that stuff. I don't need to you know, build the bridges here, but you know what I'm talking about. For the world now, gender is everything. 
So it's forget the objective, what God gave us, it's objective and clear in the science. It's all about your brain. It's all about what you think it should be because we're going to self-define ourselves into existence, which is very, very sad. You know, if you think about the deception, the deception of denying the gift that God has put literally on your flesh and acting as if it's some horrible thing and then wanting to remove it or mutilate yourself. I mean, this is truly, truly twisted. I mean, no wonder 40% of transgender persons are at risk for suicide. I mean, it's just, and it's not because of societal rejection. It's because you're denying the very created order that God put in a person. And it is very, very sad. Facebook now has 58 genders to choose from. Some schools today, elementary children, are confronted with the choice of pronouns, and they get to pick their gender apart from parents as to identify elementary school children. My sister teaches public school in Florida and said to me that one day some person came in who was a girl and asked to be called a different name. She said, I'm sorry, your name's on the roll. It's right here, and I'm going to call your name. And, and then, of, of course, she got in this big trouble because she said, look, Squeaky wants to be called Squeaky. I'm not going to call him Squeaky. I'm going to call him his name. If you want to change your name, that's one thing. But this is going on everywhere, and, and it's really mad. But here's, here's the interesting part. On one hand, while we're all confused and we're all, oh, gender fluidity, and let's just choose different things. On the other hand, we're having gender reveal parties, right? And it's not, is he a cis child or is he trans? No, it's, is he a boy or is he a girl? We go back to the basics. So the side is confused, right? This is where we need to bring clarity. We need to bring clarity mostly to our own families first and then to the boys and those that we serve, even the parents that we serve. Very, very important that we do that. Uh, the concept of transgenders, and this means basically a physiological male who thinks that they're a female and then either acts out, dresses out, or gives themselves hormones, or even goes to the point of sadly physically manipulating their body. Um, in Florida, we're bringing Walt higher in. Walt has become a friend of mine. He was born a man, uh, lived his life as a man, wanted to become a woman, had the sexual reassignment surgery, had his male part removed and, and basically became a Christian, now was remarried to his wife and lives to tell the horrible sto story and gives a great testimony and really a powerful testimony about uh, really how sad the, the life was that he lived when he made that change. This is very real. But transgenders are really turning women's sports upside down. You mark my word, if the feminists do not stand up and say enough, Title IX meant something, and when we wanted women's sports to be equal in all universities, we meant something. It's going to destroy women's sports, and it's happening everywhere. And you know what? They're turning away, and they're doing it. Why? Because they don't want to be yelled. They don't want to be screamed at. That's the only reason they're doing it, is a lack of courage. There's no science behind it. The, the, the physiological stuff on the, the state of uh, suicide and depression rates are enormous, enormous. They're ignoring that. Oh, that's because we're not accepting them. No, it's because it, you're, you're denying the creative order and the beauty that God has given you. But this is very sad. These men are going to literally destroy women's sports because they are just competing everywhere. And they're winning. Why? Because men are faster and stronger than women. And it's happening everywhere in high schools. It'll eventually happen in the Olympics as well. And you know what's going to happen? I mean, for a young lady that's really gifted, what motivation does she have to run track if a dude is going to smoke the thing every time? It doesn't make any sense. The motivation to be, for have women in sports is going to be completely dulled and just because of this nonsense that's happening all over the country. Now, finally, let's talk about God's design behind a theology of what it means to be a man, the theology behind what it means to be a male. I think that there are three things in Scripture. You could point to a bunch of things, but I think that there are three things that if you're going to view the Scripture as, as a thing of authority that are just unquestionable, okay? Um, first of all, man is made in the image and likeness of God, okay? Okay? Um, and, and, and men and women are made in the image and likeness of God, frankly. But the first thing that I believe is that men, and this is controversial, 
because some of you will disagree and that's fine. But as I see the scripture, men are called to hold authority and to lead in the family and in the church. Now I know that there are many people and I come, I went from Catholic to charismatic to Presbyterian to some kind of weird combination of that now. But anyway, I, I know that there are lots of denominations that ordain women. But as I see the scripture, I see positions of authority, bishops, elders, okay? Um, you could argue whether a pastor is a person that cares, whether that's authority or not. You can have all these debates about whether somebody speaks in the pulpit, whether they have the authority of their husband. But I, I see the principle, how you execute the principles of the story. But I see the principle in scriptures that men are uniquely called to hold authority in the family and in the church. Now, I don't see this as clear to the civil magistrate. I do not see prohibitions against women leading in the world. Now, some people will say, oh, I know Deborah was a judge and it was because, you know, the men weren't leading, etc. I, I get that, but there's no didactic teaching in the New Testament that prohibits it or even warns against it. So I see that as an area of liberty. But I do see very clearly that in the family uh, that the husband is called to lead as Christ loves the church and, 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 and also the, micro, the church is a microcosm of the family and vice versa, and we have the same pattern of leadership in the church. I, I love Norm Geisler. He just passed away a couple of months ago, one of the foremost apologists alive. He said, women have an unlimited capacity to minister. The only limitation I can see in Scripture is to hold positions of authority. Secondly, <clears throat> I see that men are called to hard work. Hard work. Um, now, let me, let me go back for a second. Why is this? I don't know why this is. I don't know why this is. Maybe it's because of the order of creation, that God creates the man first, he takes woman from the man. Maybe it's because of the order of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Maybe it's because of the pattern of Christ and the church. We know clearly in Scripture that Christ is the head, the church is the feminine or the masculine. Church is the feminine, Christ is the masculine. And so we know that the, the bride of Christ, this analogy of marriage in the scripture, we see that, the, that the Christ is the leader. And so, in, in, and we're going to talk about this more uh, toward the end. Uh, but I don't know why this is. Uh, but I do think that it is true. And look, there are many ways that this can happen. I mean, look, Rob Rye, I told you his wife was a rocket scientist. I mean, he homeschooled the kids and his wife, when she was making more money than he was, she was making the money. Now, they were doing this under his leadership. That's leadership. We don't have to get caught in traditional molds. The point is there's a principle. We should implement the principle and make sure we hold true to the principle. It doesn't have to be necessarily a traditional form that the principle takes. So men are called to hard work. This is very clear. Men, uh, mainly hard work for your family. Thessalonians 3, second chapter of Thessalonians. Even when we were with you, we give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, he shall not eat. And even stronger, this is perhaps one of the strongest verses in the entire scripture. 1 Timothy 5, 8. If any man does not provide for his own family especially the members of his own household, then he has denied the face, faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, that's like, wow. I mean, we need to pray for our men who are unemployed. We need to help them transition and uh, come around them. You know, men, men are called to do hard work, to provide for their family and to make more than they consume so that they can provide for a woman and those children that that woman uh, would produce. And then finally, the third thing that I see in scripture is that husbands are called to sacrifice in loving their wives. You know, gentlemen, we get the part about leadership and the part about submission real clear, but I don't think we ever will understand the depth of what it means to love our wives as Christ loved the church. I'm clueless. I, I look at my comments of harshness and the way I'm, I'll say or do something and think, wow, that's not the way Christ loves the church at all. And so this is a huge, huge burden. It's a huge responsibility. It's a huge challenge, and it's one that we cannot take lightly. It's one that should allow us to be willing to serve to the point of death if necessary, not just symbolically, but actual death. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church by 
covering a multitude of our sins by shedding his blood to show us mercy. It's really difficult to even explore the depths of what this means, but this is perhaps the greatest challenge that we have as men who are called to marriage. We talked about the state of nature already. Um, that would be a situation where there's no civilization and what that does, but we see these, again, these roles come to fruition in those things. So, a man protects and defends primarily his family in a way that's different. Women also protect and they defend, but in a different way. So it's not like, you know, husband and wife, they're in bed, they're going to bed, it's late at night, and then nobody can sleep, and you hear something. You hear the door. Something's outside. It's not like, honey, it's your turn. I went last time. No, no, no. It's always your turn, gentlemen. That, see, that's something we never delegate to the wife. That just does not happen, right? I mean, that's, that's when you see this whole gender equality business just go out the door in simple situations like the bump in the night when you're not sure what the bump is. So the world has got this all wrong. And if you don't think that the world and the way the world thinks about this stuff are seeping into our kids' brains, guess again. Even if you homeschool your child. I mean, I homeschool my children to build in the good stuff and block out the bad stuff. But I'll tell you right now, it's amazing how the bad stuff just seems to seep in from everywhere, right? Every time you touch the world, even in the grocery store, wherever it is, the movie theater, talking to friends in the neighborhood, the world is just seeping in and trying to, to, to infiltrate our kids' minds. So we must be diligent as parents and diligent as troop leaders. So here's the extremes of the world, right? I mean, it's, you know, you're either the rock and you're totally like jacked, muscular, like Rob Green. Where are you back there? Did you just come in? Where's Rob Green? There he is. He, Rob's our trail life male model, you know. <laughs> if anything ever happens to him, I'm second in line, though, so just saying. <laughs> Actually, more like the other guy. But um, so, yeah, so you got, the, yeah, you got the one extreme, you got like the rock extreme, right? And then you got mostly everything else that's like just, you know, all the wimpy men and the sitcoms that are doofuses, the women are smarter, they're funnier, they're making fun of the guys because they're just you know, either lazy or do doofuses and not leaders and oh, sensitive, whatever it is. So you got two extremes and it's just really either too passive or too aggressive. And so this is just a real problem for us. Now, what I want to say to you next is the most important thing about this entire talk. Um, if you don't hear anything else, this is what I want you to hear. The world, and sadly, the church as well, we talked about what it means to be a real man. The church and the world says that real men love sports. Real men love football. Real men have big muscles, and they like to do weightlifting. Real men act tough. Real men are obsessed with guns and firearms. Real men love fishing and hunting and grilling meat. And you know what? There's a reason why most men like to do those things. And those are good and godly things. Okay? The world also says real men don't cry or show emotion. And real men are not soft-spoken. They're not gentle. Real men are not vulnerable. Real men don't like the fine arts or languages or dance. That's what the world generally says. And we say it right along with them. But here's the problem. When you find the young man that looks at the list and say, I don't like any of those things. So I must not be a man. And they go right to the world. And the world's right there, ready to receive them. The LGBT movement didn't do that. We did that when we define manhood using traditional and good, but not biblical terms. We push that boy and we, you don't know what's going on because it's going on in his head. You can't see it. But when we define masculinity using those terms that are not biblical, nothing wrong with them, but that's not the essence of what being a man is. And when we do that, we send hundreds and thousands of young Christian boys into the, into the world, into a state of confusion, because they say, I don't like those things. And you know what? A lot of, a lot of young men, they're, they're, 
they're trying to figure it out. They're not masculine yet. They don't have muscles yet. It hasn't kicked in. So we have to be patient with them, right? But let me tell you something. When you say a real man is, you better have a biblical category that you're putting in that answer. Because when we say that, you don't even know. We're doing damage to young men everywhere that hear us. When we say real, we, we joke about it. And there's nothing wrong with joking because there's going to be tons of jokes by the time we get out of here tonight, right? Uh, but that, that's not what real men are. We, we talked about what real men are. And here's the essence. I boiled it down for you. This is God's design in terms of chemistry, God's design in biology, in physiology, in neurology, in sociology, in anthropology, and finally in the scripture. These are the kinds of things that we need to help young men come to grips with, that men love, they serve, and they work hard. They protect their families, and they lead. I think about the TV examples, it's just, it's just all wrong. I mean, Frazier's like all wrong. It's just, there's so many wrong, bad models. You know, you know what, here's what I love. Here's my favorites, ready? How about um, Andy Griffith, right? I mean, not particularly masculine, but he was a real man. I mean, he took care of Aunt B, took care of Opie, right? He was, he was a leader. I mean, he wasn't like, you know, all this macho guy. Yeah, you, you, know, you, you like him. I mean, he, he was a man. He, he owned the space. He, he did what he was supposed to do. He did his duty to his family. Uh, even a guy like, um, you know, my favorite on TV is Charles Ingalls. I mean, he's like the perfect man. Like, he's, he's masculine, he's tough, but he's tender, he laughs, and he was just a great example of man. I mean, you don't see examples like that anymore on TV. They're all like twisted, either extreme one way or extreme the other way. Even, even you think about a guy like Bill Gates. I mean, Bill Gates is not this masculine guy, but Bill Gates, not a Christian, but he owned the space he was in. Mr. Rogers, that's masculine. He owned, he said, I'm going to own children's television. He took dominion over that space and said, I'm going to do this. So gentlemen, when we do that, that's a very masculine act. Owning the space, saying, I'm going to take dominion over this area, this vision that God's given me, and I'm going to make it flourish for the betterment of society. Not just for me, but for the betterment of all of the world. This is what it looks like to be masculine, to own spaces like that. Let's not use superficial, worldly, and traditional concepts to define masculinity. It's very, very important. In closing, I want to give you one final picture of understanding as to why this is important. And if we have a couple of minutes for questions, maybe five minutes for questions. So we see human sexuality and marriage as two separate things. Guess what? God doesn't see it that way. He sees them as one thing. Because it's the only place that's proper for it. And everything outside of marriage that the world is promoting is a deviation from God's design, right? And so they're not two separate things. So in God's design, when he thinks about human sexuality, he thinks about marriage. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is the world taking this beautiful thing, both of these things now, not, not just marriage, but human sexuality, why is the world perverting and defiling and twisting and confusing and causing so many people to be an interest in a bondage? Marriage is a picture of who God is. Marriage and family somehow reflect. It's almost like a picture. It's a reflection of the nature, the diversity and unity in the Godhead. We're, we're husband and wife. We're separate, but we're together, right? Well, I'm a Stenberger. Joe's a Stenberger. Ben's a Stenberger, but we're all separate. So, so, so marriage is a picture of the nature and character of who God is. In Ephesians, it says what? Marriage is a picture. It says, wait a second, I'm not talking about marriage. This is a picture of the gospel. Marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. Do you understand how important this is? And the culmination of all things is what? The marriage supper of the Lamb. From Genesis to Revelation, other than the cross, I can't think of a symbol more central to all of Christian theology than marriage and human sexuality. It's a picture of who God is, of his love for us, and the culmination of all things. We don't understand this because it's not clear, but we know that somehow the church, the feminine, is going to be joined to Christ the masculine for all of eternity. 
Do you understand how important this is? When you defend marriage, when you defend these principles, you are defending the gospel. It couldn't be more important. And this is why the world is taking this one thing and perverting it and defiling it. Do you realize that 20 years ago, maybe even 10 or 15 years ago, every institution of society, every one, even if they weren't Christians, they orbited in God's design for what is a marriage, what is a man, what is a woman. We knew what these things are. It was self-evident, as the Declaration says. And even corporate America and academia, for the most part, except for the radicals at Harvard, and, and everybody, banking, the military, like we all understood what these terms were. Do you know what's happening today? Every institution of society, without exception, is moving at light speed away from God's design, away from history, tradition, logic, biology, common sense, and the collective wisdom of human history. Why? They're moving because they don't want to be yelled at. That's the only reason. We have to be the trustees of something that is powerful, something that is beautiful, and something that God has put in the earth. All of our marriages, as difficult as they can be at some time, are something that is powerful, that God has put in the earth to scream who he is, how much he loves us, and the culmination of all things. This is why we're here. This is one of the essences of trail life. And this is why the world doesn't get us. We don't want to dwell on this stuff all the time, but the problem is it's bombarding us. I said last convention, it's like it's raining all the time, so we have to have an umbrella and be on the guard because it's constantly raining on us. But I want us to see and I want us to leave here with a new and fresh understanding of the importance of these things. I leave you with this scripture and we'll have a couple seconds for some questions, but I love this scripture. Behold the kindness and the severity of our Lord. Guys, that's what we ought to be. That's a picture of a balanced, radically, the radical tension that has to be found in godly masculinity. Behold the kindness and the severity of our Lord. The world either gets it one way or the other. We have to hold them both in tension and celebrate them both and, and vigorously be accountable to other men and ask us, where do, where do I need help here? Do I need to be more kind or do I need to be more severe? Right? And so this is, this is the Lord speaking to us. This is the word for the Lord for us today. Let's just pray, and I have a couple of questions here. Father, thank you for your amazing love for us. Thank you for the gift of illumination. Thank you for the fact that you have created us differently, wonderfully, amazingly different for your purposes, for your design, for your glory, for your honor. Lord, may we just understand this issue in a new and a fresh way. Maybe recommitted that we're not going to just drift off into the world's way of thinking, but we are going to hold fast to what you have taught us in Scripture, which is not just evident in Scripture. It's evident in all the sciences, in all the world, because we know that it's true to the totality of all reality. Lord, help us. We need you. We want to pray for our children that you would protect them from the evil one, Lord, that you would protect them from this world and this enemies, the systems of this world that would seek to deceive them and destroy their minds and hearts. Lord, we love you. We worship you this day. And we thank you for this moment in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have time. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. We have time for a couple of questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and Oprah Winfrey here has a microphone. <laughs> I prefer Phil Donahue, but okay, whatever, Phil. yeah. Nobody knows Phil. That, you had to be a little bit older to yeah, know Phil, that's right? That's right. Any, any questions? Right over here. John, as we listen to you tonight, one could get the impression it's all about the, the, this flesh struggle. Talk about the spiritual component, the spiritual warfare that's going on right now so that we can understand both dimensions. Well, yeah, I mean, that's very powerful. And 
Uh, there's a lot of people that could talk about that better than I could, but we, you know, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I mean, this, this, the only conspiracy here is literally the enemy. I mean, the enemy, our, our opponents are not like in Washington, D.C. or the LGBT movement. It's the enemy. He's using them. They don't even know what's going on. I mean, they're perverting the gospel. They're perverting this beautiful, I mean, we, we, are, we are like this, the guardians of the most beautiful truth of what it means to be human. Right? And we need to protect that and pass it on to our children. But you're exactly right. This is a spiritual battle in every way. And so we need to pray. We need to ask God for his help. Uh, we need to understand that there are unseen forces that are acting upon us when we go to protect our children, when we take a stand for things. Uh, and so, yes, there's all these, um, depending on your tradition, and I don't want to get too far into that because we want to let each tradition drill down into that, but there's a lot of, we, we know clearly there's a spiritual realm and it is at work attempting to foil all the things that, that God wants to sustain. Yes. A very, very quick question. What's the, the minimum, the top age, the best age you should teach kids or anything about this, all the stuff, the, the trans and the homo and everything like that? What's the best age? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, that's a very good question actually. And it really depends. Um, my thing is, look, they're going to get this from the world, okay? And so what's going to happen is, especially if you homeschool, if you're like, oh, let's protect, 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 and you don't guide them into understanding these things, they're going to hear about it, and they're going to, oh, well, wait a second. Mom didn't tell me about that. So they're going to feel deceived, and they're going to feel like, well, I'm going to be, I want to find out about that because they didn't tell me about that, and I want to make sure I'm getting all this stuff right, I've been told. And so it really is it's a matter of discernment for you as a parent or for you as a leader um, when to uh, introduce these topics I think that, um, you know, H, I mean, one of my children is incredible. I mean, of all my children, I have one young lady. She's like brilliant. She's so smart. She picks things up. So it's just, it's just different. Um, but I think that the earlier, the better. It's not just a talk. It is a continuing conversation about things. Um, I point things out to my children in the world. They obviously get to speak with me, so they hear things and they see all kinds of weirdness everywhere. And so when we see things in the culture, we explain this is what this is. This is not God's design. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk about this in my other talk, but I think everything we should do, we should compare the world says this, but God says this, okay? And just compare what the world says with what God says and to give them an understanding of the difference. So then when they see it, they'll go, oh, I know what that is, and I understand what that is, right? And so we had pulse happen right down from my office, uh, in Orlando. And so uh, that was a very big deal. And so we bring our children into this. We guide them through it so that when they hear about it, they're already armed and protected with a, with a Christian worldview so that they're not misled when they hear it or see it in the world. So I would say the earlier you can, the better. Uh, when they start asking questions, it's probably the best time. Or when they're just confronted with something, maybe accidentally or before you thought it was appropriate. Um, you know, so, so invite these conversations. There's great tools. I want to recommend Dennis Rainey's Passport to Purity. Amazing tool. And also his, his later tool, which is even better than that, Passport to Identity, which is for older teenagers. I just went through that um, with both my sons as well. Um, first off, I want to thank you for um, your talk today. And one of the things that you mentioned was that the our technical technological advances that we've had has made it um, kind of possible for some of these things to d be developing as the playing the playing field is leveled and we're not having to protect and provide in the same ways. So like, the question I have, um, and I know Trail Life answers part of this, but how can we be training um, our boys um, in the home to be developing these these skills and um, so that we are helping them to be developing the masculine side of um, then you said that it has to be learned and developed yeah extremely broad question but a great question I mean it's just it's just a process I mean look I am not my dad didn't fish, he didn't hunt, we didn't do any sports, the Stenbergers are not particularly athletic, so I feel like I got a little bit more, uh, you know, the other side of the brain working than I do this side of the brain, and so I'm not a typical man in that way, uh, but, but I think it's important to introduce young men to things. I think that there needs to be a rite of passage, there needs to be time spent, you cannot learn to be a man by osmosis, you have to learn by hanging out with another man. And the beauty of this is when you have a fatherless uh, fa fatherless families, this is the beauty of this, is that the church gets to restore the years that the locusts have eaten, 
right? So, so that's the beauty of the church. I remember my friend Ron Carter, he was like 38, 39. He died of cancer. He served in Iraq. He left three sons behind. And he was, I mean, literally on his deathbed, we, we pledged him, Ron, we're going to take care of your sons. And so at, we just took one of each of them and we brought them on campouts and we just did what we could. One family kind of adopted one of those young men to help him out, you know, just in the best way we knew how. But it's a very broad question, but it's just a process, I think, of helping to work and to monitor young people. Um, you know, I, I knew a young man once that said, uh, I, I think I want to be a girl. I said, oh, really? Let's, let's talk about that. I didn't freak out. I didn't start pounding him and discipling him and all this stuff. But if you see things like that, I wouldn't worry about what seems to be externally feminine. That's, that's irrelevant, okay? You have to ask about internal processes. Understand you have, you're special. God's made you special. You're in the fraternity, not the sorority. You have special parts. And so very basic. I even remember with one of my children, all of my children actually, doing Christmas lights. I would just test them and say, hand me, hand me the male and hand me the female, the, the cords. And I said, how do you know that? How do you know what it was? They knew instinctively what it was. And so just simple, small things for small children. And then as they get older, to really just help them understand human sexuality and not be this weird kind of off things that you can't talk about because it's too, you know, too much of that. I think these are gifts that God's given us, and we need to steward them and help our children understand them in our perspective because if we don't do it, I can assure you the world will, okay? And so it's really important that we just uh, capture the moment. Yes? Uh, yeah, it's Dan Berger. This is John Berger. Hey, John. Yeah. I think what we're looking at here is a, a fundamental difference between two camps. If human beings evolved out of nothing, if we are the result of several phenomena, then yeah, eventually it would make sense that eventually we would take control of our own evolution and decide right and wrong, male and female, and 36 steps in between. I think it intimidates people that we were made for a purpose because then that means being able to fulfill that purpose. Well, I think that's right. Yep. John, I think this may have to be the last question tonight. Sure. Hey, John, uh, great stuff. Uh, I'm nodding all the way with everything you're saying, but you, uh, you said that the, the motivation is because they don't want to be yelled at. I, I think that's old news. Then no one's yelling anymore. I think we need to do more yelling, don't we? <laughs> Who's doing the yelling? Who would be doing the yelling? So, here, so here's what's happening. In corporate America, there's a scale that if you're not LGBT friendly, you get put on the list. And then there's, look, it's what's happened with the BSA. I mean, come on. I mean, this is what happened. They, they had a two-year study. For two years, they studied the question, should we change our membership standards and allow open expressions of homosexuality? For two years, 11 members unanimously in 2012 said, yep, for two years we studied this and we're not going to change. Within six months, they totally changed their mind. Why? Because the culture plummeted them. Everybody from NPR to, you know, Penn and Teller, I mean, literally, the, the highest levels of scouting members told me, they're killing us. I mean, they're literally pounding us every day. And they also made the mistake of allowing corporate executives that didn't share the core traditional values of scouting as well but that's the problem, is that people do not want to be called names. People do not want to take a stand for what they believe in because they'll be called names, they'll be called bigots. And literally, I mean, the other side is announced. That's their strategy. I mean, at a certain point, they just said, we're just going to start calling people names. And so we have to fear God more than we fear man, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. So when I say calling names, that's what I mean. I mean, literally, that's the whole ball of wax. I mean, a lot of these lobbyists that I talk to at the Capitol, they say, you know what? We're not really into this stuff. We just want to get these guys off our backs because we know they'll boycott us. They'll put us on their bad boy list and all that stuff. So they're doing it because of pressure. They do not want to be labeled as bigoted or discriminatory or whatever those things mean. They can't just say, well, we're not going to do this. This is, this is not good science, not good policy. It's not good, you know, physiology for people. I mean, look at the Look at the numbers, the statistical numbers on mental health. Well, John, Warren said uh, one more question, but the Holy Spirit said two more questions, so we got one more. Here it is. Hey, John. Doug Walters from Tampa. I love you, brother. Um, Thank you. Real quick, 
I remember on a wing and a prayer coming to that first conference in September 2013. And for the 1,300 of us there, it blew our minds to see the Holy Spirit working. And we just knew that something big had happened and was going to happen. Tonight just confirmed all of those hopes and dreams that we had that night and for all the people that weren't here. Um, this session tonight needs to be a mandatory session for everybody in trail life, especially with all the navigators and adventures and troop masters that are camping right now. I'm just fortunate to be on this side here. But the other thing that touched my heart uh, that I've been trying to do and our troop is trying to do, that at the first conference, we really had an emphasis on single moms and minorities because the Boy Scouts hadn't done so good there. And so I wanted you to kind of emphasize that again with the single moms and minorities recruiting them and being that example. Because as you know, in our troop, which Bill Bunkley's part of, uh, out of 25 families, we had five families going through cancer. We've had two deaths of dads. So it's really evident of how important this organization is and the role that we all play. And I cannot thank you enough, and I'm sure everybody else feels the same way, that God's hand is on this organization. God's hand is on the men and the women that are at the home office and on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So just real quick as we close to address what we talked about. So Mark and I, almost since from day one, I mean, I always call this the final vision. And you got to understand, we're a young organization. We're a small organization, okay? Jesus said 12. The Marines is pretty small too, but God, God likes small, right? He can do a lot of things with small. But um, so I always talked about the final vision, and that is really to become a father to the fatherless, to, to really, because most of our movement is fathers, we're homeschooled, predominantly white and all that. So we do want to reach out. It's, it's, as, and, and Hezekiah actually is, is working on a study committee, but it's incredibly complex. Uh, and the, the, the biggest problem is youth protection. I mean, I just can't pick a boy up somewhere and bring him to a meeting, right, under our rules. And so because of the world's craziness and worldliness and, and criminal behavior, it creates a lot of challenges. But, but let me tell you something. It's in our heart. It's on the radar, and we have not forgotten that. It may take us quite a while, but we're never going uh, to stop trying to figure out a way to create a formula so that we can be a father to the fatherless. Thank you, guys. God bless you.